Thank you, um, and thank you for coming. Um, I, when I was asked to do this, I thought long and hard about what I might say that might mean something to, to all of you. Um, and I alighted on a title for the lecture. Uh, oh, look, there it is. <laughs> one to one, listening to the narrative of the other. Um, it'll become clear why I've called it that in a moment. I started my professional career in radio at the BBC World Service, as Daniela just said, as a sub-editor in the international newsroom. I love radio, not just as a consumer, but also as a practitioner. I think it's among the most intimate and possibly the most intelligent of mediums. And I think that because one of the most important skills required in being a journalist for radio or television, and I happen to be lucky enough to have done both, is having the patience the grace and respect to be able to listen, to really listen. And of course, radio requires that of its audience too. And although I'm acutely aware that I'm currently doing the talking, and I will be for about half an hour or so, I've been thinking about the nature of listening for some time now, and it's what I want to talk about this evening. Last year, I made a series of programmes, three 13-minute long programmes for Radio 4, in a slot, it's a new slot called One to One. The idea behind the series is to give experienced broadcasters essentially a blank sheet of paper. It's a fantastic notion the Commission has had, a chance to focus on a passion, a particular interest. So it could be anything, anything at all. I used it to talk to three Muslims in Europe with an interesting story to tell. I spoke to Sonia in France, to Hanif in the UK and Hilal in Germany. I had this notion that I wanted to present something challenging to a Radio 4 audience whose diet of news and current affairs on Islam is a fairly predictable one of Muslims, Islam equals trouble or violence or oppression against women. Not always, but all too often. And of course, given the development of Islam as a political ideology, it's not surprising that it certainly can be those things. Because those who believe in that ideology say they do so in the name of Islam. But, as you and I and many people know, Islam and any faith means much more to a person than any single story. However much that single story has a tendency to dominate. Anyway, I wanted to use this slot on Radio 4, a mainstream platform, to give that audience, predominantly non-Muslim, predominantly white, middle class, and most importantly, opinion formers, a chance to listen to what a cross-section of Muslims from three different countries think about their faith, their place in the world, a place which, for each of them, was fairly hostile. Each in their own way had found a way to coexist with hostility. And more than that, they managed to live quite positive lives. They all did this in a way through something that I was really surprised to learn, having listened to them. They were willing to listen to the narrative of those who disliked them, those who were hostile to them. And only after listening did they feel that they could engage, counter, and meet the other halfway. I'd like to tell you these stories very briefly because they made such an impression on me beyond the innate interest that these people have in and of themselves. Sonia worked as an investment banker here in London and then in Paris. Between London and Paris, she decided she was going to wear the hijab. It was a personal decision based primarily on the fact that she nearly died crossing the road. She was about to cross the road and a woman who was in a much greater rush than she was pushed her out of the way. The woman who pushed her out of the way got run over by a car. In that moment, Sonia felt something visceral. She'd always been a practicing Muslim, but she felt that she needed to practice her faith in a different way. So between being a successful investment banker in, Paris, in London, she decided she was going to be a successful investment banker in Paris for the same company, but she wore a hijab. The first day she turned up at work in Paris, 
wearing a hijab, her employer's reaction was, so, you've become a terrorist, have you? Sonia stayed in that job, which really surprised me. She's excellent at it. She could easily have left, but she wanted to understand what was behind the comment and the general hostility. She's both French and a Muslim, in a country which wants to, her to keep her faith private. But that's hard when part of her faith is manifest for her, physically, in her appearance. So that was Sonia's story. Hilal is a writer, journalist and vegan who lives in the northern German countryside, in a small village, tending to her menagerie of animals that she's been collecting over the years. And she writes and she thinks about being a progressive Muslim woman who refuses to be ca categorised. She often appears on German television alongside people who are profoundly hostile to her and to Germany's large German-Turkish community, of which she is a prominent member. She's quiet, yet fiercely determined to understand and then explain. And she can only do that by listening to the narrative of those who choose to undermine hers. If you don't have a good argument, you get a better one. You don't walk away from the debate. And the third person I spoke to was a young man, he's not so young, um, called Hanif. He left his wife and his children in London to fight with the Taliban in Afghanistan. He was convinced that he was ready to give up his life to help defend what he thought were beleaguered Muslims all over the world. But the violence that he saw when he arrived at a training camp meted out to a 12-year-old boy who also, like Hanif, a man, wanted to fight. It brought him back to thoughts of his own son around that age. And he had to ask himself what he was doing thousands of miles away from his family. And he started to examine who the en enemy was. Who was this other the country he'd grown up in, this one. The one that had cared for him, this one. Or the one he was pledging his allegiance to. Or even pledging an allegiance to the notion of the Ummah for him. That was what propelled him to Afghanistan. But it was also what propelled him home. He decided to return to his biological family. And he set up a charity to help young men who are lost and who think that fighting a jihad by killing is the only way. These three people who I talked to last year made a lasting impression on me, which is why I've chosen to talk about them tonight. But they also made me think about something else that I was involved with several years ago. And I started to think whether there were connections. In 2006, the pianist and conductor Daniel Barenboim was invited by the BBC to give the annual wreath lectures. He delivered them in places that mean something to him, places where he's lived or places where he's had a professional connection. London, Chicago, Berlin, Jerusalem and Ramallah. For those of you not familiar with Daniel Barenboim and his East-West Divan Orchestra, it was something he formulated with the late Edward Said of bringing Israeli and Arab musicians together to play together and in so doing discover something about their commonality, their interdependence. In setting up this orchestra, Baron Boyne uses the language he knows best, that of music, to demonstrate that in an orchestra you have to listen as well as play. <clears throat> At the time, I was the BBC's arts correspondent, and I went to his lectures in London, Berlin, and Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, I spent some time with him, filming with him, and in particular, what interested me was what he was going to say in Jerusalem, in this contested, potent city. He wanted to announce his commitment to build a school in that city devoted to the study of Arab music and culture. I'm not entirely sure that anything came of it. He's a controversial figure in Israel, as many know, and I'm not sure he managed to persuade people that this was a going concern. But what was intriguing for me was that he wanted to try, that for him, Israelis needed to pay attention to, listen to, and engage with the culture of those they perceived to be their enemy. 
that remains an incredibly powerful idea to me. And I think it's powerful because people underestimate what culture can do. Culture is often seen as an escape, the thing we do to get away from reality. But what if we consider the bigger reality that culture actually creates? Music, art, writing. They deal with everything that you can imagine in a whole human life. Conflict, strategy, love, enmity, possibility, and so on. To dismiss these things as peripheral to, say, politics, to the cut and thrust of debate, is a profound mistake in my view. It's a sign of missed possibilities. Baron Boyne understands this, mainly because he listens to the narrative of the other. In fact, he calls it listening to the narrative of the enemy, whoever that happens to be. None of this is to do with faith in a conventional capital F kind of way, but it is connected to faith with a small f, faith in our common humanity, our common stories. And also it's connected to our sometimes quite visceral fear of the other, whatever that other is for us. And of course, it's different things for each of us. Just recently in Gaza, when I was presenting a, a, uh, the programme that I present every day, News Hour, on the World Service, we ran this story. Um, the political party in power there, Hamas, decided that it was going to teach young Palestinian children Hebrew. Their motive is interesting. They regard Hebrew as the language of their enemy, and they want to let the enemy know that they're not afraid of them, and learning their language, they think, will give them an edge. Now, you can argue that the motive is far from what you might want to see, which is a response to a possible outbreak of peace and understanding and using language in that way. But, of course, it's not. I, however, take a different view. What if one, just one, Arab child who can reads one story in Hebrew and that child starts to change its view of how much the Israelis are really different to him or her? The possibilities are rich, even if the impulse to teach children is from a place of enmity. And I like to think, I like to hope that Hamas has miscalculated. Learning to listen to the other is an acknowledgement that there isn't just a single story, that there are many. One of the things that I think is quite extraordinary about the, the globalised world that we live in now is the thing that people don't talk about so much, the dangers in that globalised world. Because I think what we're doing is creating clusters of like-minded communities. They can be liberals or they can be conservatives, agnostics or believers, rich or poor, those from the East or the West. Each like-minded group creates stereotypes of those who aren't in that group. And the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, just that they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story. How stories are told, who tells them, when they're told, how many stories are told, are dependent on power. I know this because I grew up in a family in which I was expected to conform to a single story. And that story was one of containment, staying within my group, staying within one way of looking at the world, which was small but safe. I tried very hard growing up in a monocultural family to listen to my parents. I did. I was dutiful up to a point. And there was a point when I started to do that thing that I've been banging on about. I began to listen to the narrative of the other. And the other for me, in this case, growing up in South London, in a Pakistani Muslim family, was the world outside my parents' house. It was the white world. It was the world of books. We had no books in my house. There was no expectation that I would go to university or do anything other than get married and have children. And there was no real ambition that my sister and I would have careers. Our identities were forged for us by parents who were nervous that we would 
fail in a world that they believed was hostile to us. And that's my problem with identity politics, I guess. It often requires a fixed, rigid, certain way of being. And the narrative of the other, for me, was fluid, mutating, cacophonous. I loved it. Every book I read, every concert I went to, every conversation I had with somebody other than someone in my family presented me with a glimpse into a world beyond myself. Culture does that to you. And I think people underestimate its centrality in our lives. Not so much at their peril, but just, just makes me sad that they diminish it. Culture transcends stereotypes because its very nature is plural. And stories in particular, everyone knows this, stories force you to imagine the life of someone else. They force you to stand in someone else's shoes, to hear, to feel, to see what they see. The Sufis say that knowledge that does not take you beyond yourself is far worse than ignorance. I really like that. That's why the stories of those three Muslims I met in making those radio programs have stayed with me. These are people who, although all around them, they perceive, all around them, the people who see them perceive them to be stuck in their way of living, them to be stuck in the way in which they believe. They have gone beyond themselves. That's why Daniel Barenboim remains an intellectual I admire, because he's taken a leap of faith and listened to something he didn't have to. And perhaps those children in Gaza will, with Hebrew in their hearts, learn to listen to it differently one day. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all, from time to time, unlearn what we think we are sure of? And that requires listening. Erase what we know, and then when we start to think again, we do so not with our minds every time, but with our hearts. I don't think it's much of a stretch for any of us to love our friends or our families, in most cases. It's enlightened self-interest to do so, and so we do. But it's a much bigger ask to love your enemy, someone who has your disgrace and your destruction as a goal. Maybe a good start would be to start by listening to your enemy, listening to your other. I'm going to leave you with an African proverb. The fool speaks, the wise man listens. And I'm going to stop now and just say thank you to all of you for listening.